Yeah, I think the microphone's just so good it's picking up like the ruffling of my shirt and stuff. Anyway, this is chapter two of Cancer Ward by Alexander I. Solzhenitsyn, read to you by Carter Banks. Chapter two, education doesn't make you smarter. Within a few hours, the first evening in the ward, Pavel Nikolaevich became haunted with fear. The hard lump of his tumor, unexpected, meaningless, and quite without use, had dragged him in like a fish on a hook and flung him onto this iron bed, a narrow, mean bed with creaking springs and an apology for a mattress. Having once undressed under the stairs, said goodbye to the family, and come up to the ward, you felt the door to all your past life had been slammed behind you, and the life here was so vile that it frightened you more than the actual tumor. He could no longer choose something pleasant or soothing to look at. He had to look at the eight abject beings who were now his equals. Eight sick men in faded, worn pink and white pajamas, patched and torn here and there, and almost all the wrong size. And he could not even choose what to listen to. He had to listen to these uncultured creatures and their wearisome conversations, which had nothing to do with him and were of no interest to him. He would have loved to command them all to be quiet, especially the tiresome fox-haired one with the bandage grip round his neck and the constricted head. Everyone called him simply Yefrem, though he was not a young man. It was impossible to restrain Yefrem. He refused to lie down and never went outside the ward, just paced restlessly up and down the central aisle. There was an asterisk next to young man uh, at the bottom of the page, a footnote. Uh, this is a mark of disrespect in Russian. An older man would normally be addressed by his first name and his patronymic as Pavel Nikolaevich, meaning Pavel, son of Nikolai. It's a note from the translator. From time to time, he would screw up his face as if he was being injected and clutch his head. Then he would start walking up and down again. After these walks, he always stopped at the foot of Rusonov's bed leaned the rigid top half of his body toward Rasanov, over the rails, thrust his broad, pockmarked, sullen face forward and lectured him. You've had it, Professor. You'll never go home again. See? It was very warm in the ward. Pavel Nikolaevich was lying on the top of the blanket in his pajamas and skullcap. He adjusted his gilt-rimmed spectacles, glared severely at Yefrem, as he knew so well how to do, and replied, I am at loss, comrade, to know what you require of me, and why you are trying to intimidate me. I don't ask questions, do I? Yefram snorted maliciously. Who cares about your questions? You still won't be going back home. You may as well give back your glasses and your new pajamas. After this crude outburst, he straightened his clumsy body and started pacing up and down the aisle again, like a man possessed. Of course, Pavel Nikolaevich could have cut him short and put him in his place, but somehow he could not summon his usual willpower. It was already low, and it had sunk even lower at the words of his bandaged devil. He needed support, but instead he was being pushed down into a pit. In a matter of hours, he had as good as lost all his personal status, reputation, and plans for the future, and had turned into 154 pounds of hot, white flesh that did not know what tomorrow would bring. His face probably revealed his melancholy state, for on one his subsequent walks, Yefram stopped opposite him and said quite peaceably, Even if they do let you go home, you'll be back here pretty quick. The crab loves people. Once he's grabbed you with his pincers, he won't let you go till you croak. Pavel Nikolaevich did not have enough strength to protest, and Yefrem set off again. 
In fact, there was no one in the room to rein him in. All the others there seemed either apathetic wrecks or non-Russians. Along the other wall there were only four beds because the stove jutted out. The one directly opposite Rusanov's foot to foot with his across the aisle was Yefren's. The other three were occupied by youngsters. A simple, rather swarthy boy next to the stove, a young Uzbek with a crutch, and by the window, thin as tapeworm and doubled up on his bed, a youth whose skin had turned quite yellow and who lay groaning continuously. In Pavel Nikolaevich's row, there were two Asians on his left, then a young Russian lad by the door, tall with short cropped hair. He was sitting, reading. Next to Pavel Nikolaevich, in the last bed by the window, lay, it seemed, another Russian, but being this man's neighbor was hardly a matter of rejoicing. He had a villainous cutthroat's mug. It was probably the scar that made him look that way. It started by the corner of his mouth and ran along the bottom of his left cheek, almost to his neck. Or perhaps it was his black, uncombed hair standing up on end in all directions, or else his coarse, tough expression. The cutthroat had pretensions to culture. However, he was reading a book and had almost finished it. The lights were switched on, two bright lamps hanging from the ceiling. It was already dark outside. They were waiting for supper. There's an old guy here. Yefrem would not let up. He's lying downstairs. He's being operated on tomorrow. Back in 42, they cut a tiny cancer out of him and said, Fine, it's nothing. Off you go. See? Yefrem seemed to be rattling on, but his voice sounded as though he was the one being cut open. Thirteen years went by and he forgot about the clinic, drank vodka, screwed women. He's a bit of a lad. Wait till you meet him. And he's got cancer. That big in him now. He smacked his lips with pleasure. I guess it'll be straight from the operating table onto the mortuary slab. Now then, I've had quite enough of your gloomy predictions. Pavel Nikolaevich brushed him aside and turned away. He hardly recognized his own voice. It sounded so plaintive, so lacking in authority. No one uttered a sound. The emaciated young man by the window in the other row was also being a nuisance. He kept twisting and turning. He tried sitting up. That was no good. He tried lying down. That was no good either. He doubled up, hugging his knees to his chest. Unable to find anything more comfortable, he laid his head not on the pillow, but on the frame of the bed. He was moaning very softly, the grimaces and spasms on his face showing his pain. Pavel Nikolaevich turned away from him too, lowered his feet into his bedroom slippers, and began idly inspecting his bedside table, opening and shutting the little door of the closet where his food was tightly packed, and then the little top drawer which contained his toilet requisites and his electric razor. Yefrem still kept pacing up and down, arms folded tightly across his chest. Sometimes he winced with stabbing internal pains and droned a refrain like funeral dirge. Yes, it's terrible situation we're in, a terrible situation. Pavel Nikolaevich heard a smacking sound behind his back. He turned round carefully, even the slightest movement of his neck was painful, and saw it was his neighbor the cutthroat, who had snapped shut the book he had now finished and was turning it over and over in his large rough hands, diagonally across the dark blue binding and also down the spine, stamped in gold and already dulled, was the signature of the author. Pavel Nikolaevich could not make out whose signature it was, but he didn't care to address a question to a type like that. He had thought up a nickname for his neighbor bone chewer. It suited him very well. Bone chewer gazed at the book with big, sullen eyes and addressed the whole room in a shamelessly loud voice. If Diomka hadn't picked this book out of the cupboard, 
I would have sworn it was specifically sent our way. What about Dayomka? What book? responded the lad by the door, looking up from his own. You wouldn't find one like it, not if you turn the whole town upside down. Bone Crusher looked at the broad, flat back of Yefram's head. His hair had not been cut for months. It would have been too uncomfortable. So it stuck out of the top of his bandage. Then he looked at Yefram's stained face. Yefram, that's enough of your whining. Here, read this book. Yefram stopped dead like a thwarted bull and looked at him dazedly. Read? Why should I read? We'll all kick the bucket soon. Boneshewer Scar twitched. That's the point. If you don't hurry, you'll have kicked the bucket before you've read it. Here you are. Quick. He held out the book, but Yefram did not move. There's too much reading here. I don't want to read. Are you illiterate or something? said Bone Shewer, trying half-heartedly to talk him into it. What do you mean? I'm very literate. When I've got to be, I'm very literate. Very literate. Bone Shewer fumbled for his pencil on the windowsill, opened the book at the back, looked through it, and made some marks here and there. Don't be afraid, he murmured. They're nice, short little stories. Here, just these few here. Try them. I am fed up with your whining. Do you hear? Read a book. I'm not afraid of nothing. Yefram took the book and tossed it on the bed. Amajan, the young Uzbek, came limping through the door on one crutch. He was the only cheerful one in the room. Spoons at the ready, he shouted. The swarthy boy by the stove came to life. They are bringing the grub, boys. In came the food orderly in a white coat, carrying a tray above her shoulder. She shifted it in front of her and started going round the beds. Except for the tortured young man by the window, they all stirred themselves and took the plates off the tray. Everyone in the ward had a bedside table. Only Dayomka, the young lad, did not have his own, but he shared one with the big-boned Kazakh, whose upper lip was swollen with a hideous, uncovered, reddish-brown scab. Quite apart from the fact that Pavel Nikolaevich did not feel like eating at all, even the sort of food he had brought from home, one glance at the supper, a rectangular rubbery suet pudding with yellow jelly on top, and that filthy gray aluminum spoon with a double twist in the handle served as another bitter reminder of where he had landed and what a mistake he had probably made in agreeing to come to this clinic. Except for the moaning lad, they set about their food like one man. Pavel Nikolaevich did not take the plate in his hands, but tapped the edge of it with his nail, looking round to see who he could pass it on to. Some of them were sitting sideways to him. Others had their backs to him. The young man by the door was the only one facing him. "'What is your name?' asked Pavel Nikolaevich, without raising his voice. It was the young fellow's job to hear what he had said. There was a clatter of spoons, but the young boy understood it was himself being addressed and answered readily enough. Prashka, er, uh, I mean, Prokofi Semyonich, Semyonich, Prokofi Semyonovich, Sem Semyonich trying to get these right the first time, so I'll have them memorized for the rest of the book. Anyway, Proshka, uh, I mean, Prokofi Semyonich, take it. Yeah, all right. Proshka came over, took the plate, and nodded gratefully. Pavel Nikolaevich felt the hard lump under his jaw and suddenly realized he was not one of the milder cases here. Only one out of nine of them was bandaged up, Yefram, just in the place where they might cut Pavel Nikolaevich open too. And only one of them was in great pain. And only that healthy-looking Kazakh in the next bed, but one had that deep red scab. And as for the young Uzbek's crutch, he hardly leaned on it at all. And there was no sign of any tumor or deformity on any of the others. 
They all looked like healthy people, especially Proshka. His face glowed all over, as if he were on vacation, not in a hospital. He had a fine appetite, judging by the way he was licking that plate clean. There was a gray tinge about Bone Chewer's face. It was true, but he moved freely, talked without restraint, and was attacking his dessert with such relish that the idea flashed through Pavel Nikolaevich's mind that he might be a malingerer who had attached himself to a state feeding place, because in our country, the sick are fed free of charge. But Pavel Nikolaevich was different. The lump of his tumor was pressing his head to one side, made it difficult for him to turn over, and was increasing in size every hour. Only here, the doctors did not count the hours. All the time, from lunch to supper, no one had examined Rusonov, and he had had no treatment. And it was with this very bait that Dr. Donsova had lured him here. Immediate treatment. Well, in that case, she must be a thoroughly irresponsible and criminally negligent woman. Rusonov had trusted her, and he lost valuable time in this cramped, musty, dirty ward where he might have been telephoning and flying to Moscow. Resentment at the delay and the realization of having made a mistake on top of the misery of his tumor so stabbed at Pavel Nikolaevich's heart that he could not bear anything from the noise of dishes scraped by spoons to the iron bedsteads and rough blankets, the walls, the lights, the people. He felt that he was in a trap, and that until the next morning any decisive step was impossible. Deeply miserable, he lay there, covering his eyes from the light and from the whole scene with the towel he had brought from home. To take his mind off things, he began thinking about his home and his family, and what they would be doing now. Yuri would already be on the train. It was his first practical inspection. It was very important. He should look well. But Yuri was not assertive, and he was a bungler. He might make a fool of himself. Aviette was spending her vacation in Moscow. She would be amusing herself a bit, going to theaters. But her main aim was business, finding out the lay of the land perhaps making a few contacts. After all, it was her last year at university. She had to take her bearings on life. Aviette would make a clever journalist. She was very businesslike, and of course, she would have to move to Moscow. Out here wouldn't be big enough for her. She was so intelligent and talented. There was no one else in the family to touch her. Pavel Nikolaevich was unresentfully glad that his daughter had grown up far more educated than himself. She hadn't had much experience yet, but she was so quick to catch on. Laverick was something of a dropout, indifferent to his studies, but his talent lay in sports. He'd already been to a sports tournament in Riga, where he'd stayed in a hotel like a grown-up. And he was already racing their car about. He was taking driving lessons with the cadet force and hoped to get his license. In his second semester, he'd failed in two subjects. He'd have to work a lot harder. Then there was Micah. She was most likely already at home playing the piano. She was the first one in the family to play. And Julebars, who would be lying on the mat in the corridor. Last year, Pavel Nikolaevich himself had taken him for his morning walk, since he felt it was good for his own health. Now Laverick would take him instead. He liked to let the dog chase passers-by a little and then say, It's all right, don't be frightened, I've got him. But the harmonious, exemplary Rusonov family, their well-adjusted way of life, and their immaculate apartment in the space of a few days, all this had been cut off from him. It was now on the other side of his tumor. They were alive and would go on living whatever happened to their father. However much they might worry, 
fuss or weep, the tumor was growing like a wall behind him, and on his side of it, he was alone. Thinking about home did not help him, so Pavel Nikolaevich tried to distract himself with affairs of state. A session of the USSR Supreme Soviet was due to open on Saturday. Nothing important was expected to happen. The budget would be approved. There had been shooting in the Taiwan Strait. When he left home for the hospital that morning, the radio had just begun broadcasting a long report on heavy industry. But here in the ward, there wasn't even a radio, and there wasn't one in the corridor either. A fine state of affairs. At the very least, he'd have to see he got Pravda every day. Today, heavy industry had come up, and yesterday, there had been a decree on the increase in output of meat and dairy products. Yes, the economy was advancing by leaps and bounds, and this would mean, of course, major changes in a number of state and economic organizations. Pavel Nikolaevich had already begun to imagine how the reorganization would be implemented on republic and province level, and province level. These reorganizations were always rather exciting. They served as a temporary diversion from everyday work. The officials would be telephoning each other, holding meetings and discussing the possibilities. And whichever direction the reorganization took, whether this way or that, no one, including Pavel Nikolaevich, ever suffered a drop in rank. There were only promotions. But affairs of state did not succeed in diverting him or cheering him up either. There was a stabbing pain under his neck. His tumor, deaf and indifferent, had moved in to shut off the whole world. There again, the budget, heavy industry, cattle and dairy farming, and reorganization. They were all on the other side of this tumor. On this side was Pavel Nikolaevich Rusonov alone. A pleasing female voice sounded through the ward. Although nothing could possibly seem pleasant to Pavel Nikolaevich today, this voice was, frankly, delicious. Now let's take your temperature. It was as if she was promising to hand out candy. Rasanov removed the towel from his face, raised himself slightly, and put on his spectacles. Oh, what joy! It wasn't dark, doleful, Maria, but a trim, firmly built girl, wearing not a folded kerchief, but a little cap over her golden hair, like the doctor's. Standing over his bed, she said cheerily to the young man by the window, Azovkin! Hey, Azovkin! He lay in an even more awkward position than before, diagonally across the bed, face down, like a dog, and peering through the rails of the bed as if he were in a cage. Shadows of pain inside him passed across his drawn face. One hand hung down to the floor. Now come along, pull yourself together, said the nurse, trying to shame him. Take the thermometer yourself. He just managed to raise his hand from the floor. It was like drawing a bucket out of a well, and took the thermometer. He was so exhausted, so taken up with his pain, that it was impossible to believe he was no more than 17 years old. Zoya, he groaned beseechingly, give me a hot water bottle. You're your own worst enemy, she said severely. We gave you a hot water bottle, but you didn't put it on your injection. You put it on your stomach. But it helps me so much, he persisted in a tone of great suffering. It makes your tumor grow. You've been told that already. Hot water bottles aren't allowed in the oncology department. We had to get one specifically for you. Well, I won't take my injection then. But Zoya was no longer listening. She was tapping her dainty little finger on the rail of Bone Shewer's bed. Where's Kostoglatov? she asked. Well, 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 Pavel Nikolaevich had hit the nail on the head. The nickname was perfect. He's gone for a smoke, Daumka called over from the door. He was still reading. I'll give him smoke, grumbled Zoya. 
Weren't some girls lovely? Pavel Nikolaevich gazed with pleasure at her generous, tightly laced finger and her wide, almost staring eyes. He gazed at her with detached admiration and felt himself soften. She had held the thermometer out to him with a smile. She was standing right next to the tumor, but gave no sign, not even by a raised eyebrow, that she was horrified by the thing or that she had never seen one like it before. "'Hasn't any treatment been prescribed for me?' asked Rizonov. "'Not yet,' she smiled apologetically. "'But why not? Where are the doctors?' "'They have finished work for the day.' There was no point in being angry with Zoya, but it must be someone's fault that he was not being treated. He had to do something. Rusanov despised inactivity and intellectual characters. When Zoya came back to read his temperature, he asked her, Where is your outside telephone? How can I find it? After all, he could make up his mind right now and telephone comrade Ostapenko. The very idea of a telephone brought Pavel Nikolaevich back into his normal world and restored his courage. He felt like a fighter again. There's an asterisk at the bottom of the book that says, Kostoglot in Russian means bone swallower. Now it makes sense. 98.6. Zoya smiled and made the first mark on the graph of the new temperature chart hanging on the foot of the bed. There's a telephone in the registrar's office, but you can't go there now. It's the other entrance. Forgive me, young lady. Pavel Nikolaevich raised himself a little, and his voice became slightly severe. But how can the clinic be without a telephone? Suppose something happened now, to me, for instance. We'd run over there and telephone for you. Zoya stood her ground. Well, suppose... There was a storm, or heavy rain. Zoya had already moved on to his neighbor, the old Uzbek, and was filling in his chart. In the daytime, we go over there straight away, but it's locked now. All right, she was a sweet girl, but he could also be fresh. She refused to hear him out, and even now was moving on to the Kazakh. Raising his voice involuntarily, Pavel Nikolaevich called out after her, there must be another telephone. It's impossible for there not to be. There is, answered Zoya. She was already squatting by the Kazakh's bed, but it's in the head doctor's office. Well, that's the problem. Dayomka. 98.4. The office is locked. Nizamutin Baromovich doesn't like, and she walked out of the room. It was logical, of course. It's not very pleasant to have people going into your office when you're not there. All the same, in a hospital, proper arrangements should be made. For an instant, a tiny wire linking him with the outside world had been dangled before him. And it had snapped. Once again, the tumor under his jaw, the size of a fist, had shut out the entire world. Pavel Nikolaevich reached out for his little mirror, and looked at himself. How the tumor was spreading. Seen through the eyes of a complete stranger, it would be frightening enough, but even through his own. No, this thing could not be real. No one else around him had anything like it. In all his 45 years, Pavel Nikolaevich had never seen such a deformity. He did not try to work out whether it had grown any more or not. He just put the mirror away, took some food from his bedside table, and started chewing. The two roughest types, Yefrem and Bone Shewer, were not in the ward. They had gone out by the window. Azovkin had twisted himself into a new position, but he was not groaning. The rest were quiet. He could hear the sound of pages being turned, and some of them had gone off to sleep. All Rasonov had to do was get to sleep while away the night. Think of nothing, and then tomorrow, give the doctors a dressing down. So he took off his pajamas, lay down under the blankets in his underclothes, covered his head with 
the towel he had brought from home and tried to sleep. But through the silence, there came a particularly audible and irritating sound of somebody whispering somewhere. It seemed to be going straight into Pavel Nikolaevich's ear. He could not bear it. Tore the towel away from his face, raised himself slightly, trying to avoid hurting his neck, and discovered it was his neighbor, the Uzbek. He was all shriveled up and thin, an old man, almost brown-skinned, with a little black pointed beard, and wearing a shabby skull cap as brown as himself. He lay on his back with his hands behind his head, staring at the ceiling and whispering, prayers or something, probably, the old fool. Hey you! Aksakal! Rusonov wagged his finger at him. Stop it, you're distracting me! You're disturbing me! The Aksakal fell silent. Rusonov lay down again and covered his face with the towel. But still he could not get to sleep. Now he realized that the reason he could not settle down was the penetrating light from the two ceiling lamps. The shades were not made of frosted glass and did not cover the bulbs properly. He could sense the light even through the towel. Pavel Nikolaevich grunted and again raised himself from the pillow with his elbows, carefully, to avoid stabbing pains from his tumor. Proshka! Proshka was standing beside his bed near the light switch and beginning to undress. Young man, turn off the light, Pavel Nikolaevich commanded. Another asterisk at the bottom of the page. Apparently, Aksakol in Uzbek means village elder. Here he used this mockingly. Uh, nurse hasn't come with the medicines yet, faltered Proshka. But he reached up one hand toward the switch. A voice behind Rasonov. Who do you think you are? You're not the only person here. Pavel Nikolaevich sat up straight and put on his spectacles. Carefully nursing his tumor, he turned, making the bed springs creak, and said, You might be a bit more polite. The rude fellow pulled a face and answered in a low voice, Don't change the subject. You're not my boss. Pavel Nikolaevich threw him a withering glare, but this had no effect. Whatever, on bone sure. Okay, but what do you need the light for? Rasonov went over to the peaceful negotiation. So I can pick my asshole, said Kostoglatov coarsely. Pavel Nikolaevich began to have difficulty with his breathing, although by now he was pretty well acclimatized to the air in the ward. The impudent fellow ought to be discharged from the hospital at twenty minutes' notice and sent back to work, but at the moment he had no concrete means of action. He would, of course, mention him to the hospital administrator later on. If you want to read or something, you can go out into the corridor, Pavel Nikolaevich pointed out, trying to be fair. Why should you take it upon yourself to decide for everyone? There are different sorts of patients here, and distinctions have to be made. There will be distinctions, Bonesure showed his fangs. They'll write you an obituary. Party member since the year zero. As for us, they'll just carry us out feet first. Pavel Nikolaevich had never come across such unrestrained insubordination, such unbridled willfulness. He could not recall anything like it. He found himself at a loss. How could he counter this sort of thing? He couldn't complain to that girl. The conversation would have to be cut short for the present and most dignified manner possible. Pavel Nikolaevich took off his spectacles, lay down carefully, and covered his head with the towel. He was exploding with indignation and anguish at the thought of how he had weakly agreed to enter this clinic. But it would not be too late to get a discharge tomorrow. It was shortly after eight o'clock by his watch. Oh well, for the moment he would put up with it all. Sooner or later they'd quiet down. But the floor started shaking again as someone paced up and down between the beds. Of course, it was Yefren coming back in. The old floorboards vibrated with his footsteps, and Rusonov could feel the vibrations through the bed rails and the pillow. However, Pavel Nikolaevich decided 
not to rebuke him, but to endure it. There's such bad manners and impudence among our people. We still haven't got rid of it. How can we lead them to a new society carrying this burden? The evening dragged endlessly. The nurse began her rounds once, twice, a third and fourth time. A mixture for one, a powder for another, injections for two more. Azovkin uttered a shriek when he was given his injection, and again begged for a hot water bottle to help the stream, to help the serum disperse more quickly. Yefrem kept tramping up and down, unable to find peace. Amajan and Proshka were talking from their beds. It was as if they were only now coming properly to life, as if they hadn't a care in the world or anything that needed curing. Even Dayomka was not ready to sleep. He came up and sat on Kostoglatov's bed, and they began muttering, right by Pavel Nikolaevich's ear. I'm going to try to read a bit more, Dayomka was saying. Well, there's time. I'd like to go to university. That's a good thing, but remember, education doesn't make you smarter. What's the point of talking like that to a child? What do you mean doesn't make you smarter? It's just one of those things. So what do you make so what does make you smarter? Life. That's what. Dayomka was silent for a moment, then replied, I don't agree. In our unit, there was a commissar, Pashkin. He used to say, education doesn't make you smarter, nor does rank. They give you another star on your shoulder, and you think you're smarter. Well, you're not. So what do you mean? There's no need to study? I don't agree. Of course, you should study. Study. Only remember, for your own sake, it's not the same as intelligence. What is intelligence, then? Intelligence. Trusting your eyes, but not your ears. Which subject are you interested in? I haven't decided yet. I am interested in history and literature. What about engineering? No, uh, strange it was like that in our day. But now boys prefer engineering, don't you? No, I think I've a passion for social problems. Social problems? Oh, Dayomka, you'd better learn to assemble radio sets. Life's more peaceful if you're an engineer. What do I care about peace? If I lie here a month or two, I shall have to catch up with the ninth class for the second half year. What about textbooks? I've got two here. Stereometry's very difficult. Stereometry? Bring it here. Rasanov heard the lad walk off and get his book. Let me see. Yes. Yes. My old friend, Kiselyov's stereometry. The very same straight lines and planes, parallel with in the same plane, then it is parallel to the plane itself. Hell, what a book, Dayomka. Wouldn't it be fine if everyone wrote like that? Not fat at all, is it? But what a lot it contains. They teach an 18-month course out of this book. They taught me, too. I used to know it backwards. When? I'll tell you. I was in ninth class, too, the second half year. That would be in 37 and 38. It feels strange to have it all... to have it in my hands again. Geometry was my favorite subject. And then? Then what? After school. After school, I read a splendid subject, geophysics. Where was that? The same place, Leningrad. And what happened? And what happened? I finished my first year, and then in September 39, there was an order to call all, uh, to call up all 19-year-olds into the army, and I was hauled in. Then what? I was on active service. And after that? After that? Don't you know what happened? The war. You? Were you an officer? No, sergeant. Why? Because if everyone was made a general, there'd be no one to win the war. If a plane passes through a straight line parallel to a second plane and intersects that plane, then the line of intersection... Listen, Domka, you and I will do some stereometry every day. We'll really push ahead. Would you like to? Yes, I would. 
Isn't that the limit? Right under my ear. I'll give you lessons. Fine. Oh. There's like no way to tell who this is coming from, so I'm trying my best. I'll give you lessons. Fine. Otherwise, you'll really waste time. We'll begin right now. <laughs> Let's take these three axioms. You see, these axioms are simple in form, but they'll come into every theorem. I think what's going on right now is like he's trying to sleep and uh, like these two are like, you think the conversation's gonna end soon, but all of a sudden they're like starting a whole fucking class at like three in the morning. So I think that's what's going on. So he goes, would you like lessons? And he's like, oh yes. He's like, I'll give you lessons. Fine. Otherwise you'll really waste time. We'll begin right now. Let's take these three axioms. You see, these axioms are simple in form, but they'll come into every theorem, and you have to spot where. Here's the first one. If two points in a straight line are in a plane, then every point along that line is also in the plane. What's the idea of that? Look, supposing this book is a plane, and the pencil is a straight line. All right, now try to arrange them. They plunged into the subject and droned on about axioms and deductions. But Pavel Nikolaevich resolved to bear it. His back turned on them pointedly. Pointedly. At last, they stopped talking and broke up. After his double sleeping draft, Azovkin dropped off too and was quiet. Then the Akas... Aksak... Aksakol? Aksakol. Then the Aksakol started coughing. Pavel Nikolaevich was lying his face toward him. Pavel Nikolaevich was lying with his face towards him. In such a disgusting manner, too. With that whistling noise on and on. So that it seemed he was going to choke. Pavel Nikolaevich turned his back on him. He removed the towel from his head but it still wasn't properly dark. Light was coming in from the corridor, and noises too. People walking about and clanking spittoons and buckets. He could not get to sleep. His tumor weighed him down. His whole happy life, so well thought out, so harmonious and useful, was now about to crack. He felt very sorry for himself. One little push would be enough to bring tears to his eyes. It was Yefrem who did not fail to provide the push. Unrestrained, even in the dark, he was telling Amajan next to him some idiotic fairy tale. Why should a man live a hundred years? This is how it happened. Allah gave all the animals fifty years each, and that was enough. But man came last, and Allah had only twenty-five left. You mean a twenty-fiver? asked Amajan. That's right. And man started complaining it wasn't enough. Allah said, it's enough. And man said, no, it, it isn't. So Allah said, all right, go out and ask. Maybe someone has some over there and will give you some. Man went off and met a horse. Listen, he said, my life's too short. Give me some of yours. All right, said the horse, take 25 years. Man went a bit further and met a dog. Listen, dog, let me have some of your life. All right, have 25 years. On he went. He met a monkey, and he got 25 years out of him, too. And then he went back to Allah, and Allah said, As you wish, it's up to you. The first 25 years you will live like a man. The second 25 you'll work like a horse. The third you'll yap like a dog. And for the last 25, people will laugh at you like they laugh at a monkey. Asterisk at the bottom of the page, a footnote, a 25 ruble note. Amajan, an Uzbek, is making a joke to prove how well he speaks Russian. That's the end of chapter two. Yeah, this is going to be a great book. I'm pretty pumped about it. It's a lot more fun to read, but it's also uh, twice as easy to fuck up. Um... Anyway, I hope you guys were able to follow that. Sweet, dude. I'm pumped. Uh, yeah, he, this is... Um, 
one of my favorite writers, and uh, it's amazing to me that no one has put a Cancer Ward audiobook anywhere. So I have the pleasure of being the first to record it, but it's also like I have to do it justice, so we will see how it goes. Anyway, thanks for tuning in, y'all, and uh, see you tomorrow at 9.